After that point, I think we're going to see a massive bleed in dominance all the way back down to sub 35% as money flows from Bitcoin into alts for a massive alt season likes of which we haven't seen since 2017. What's up, everybody? Good morning, good afternoon, good night. Welcome to the BitLab Academy stream. I've got an incredible guest with you, with us here today. This is somebody I've been following for quite a long time, and I have to say, he gives a very balanced views of the market. And the gentleman we're gonna be talking about is Credible Crypto. I got his page up right here. Make sure you give him a follow. Now, this person has been in the markets longer than, uh, a bit longer than I have, and uh, he's gonna keep his absolute focus here directly on the chart. So without any further ado, we're gonna go ahead and bring on Mr. Credible Crypto. How you doing, sir? How you feeling? Thank you for being here. I'm doing great. Uh, thank you for having me, appreciate it. Uh, yeah, ready to, ready to go. So before we dive in and get into any of those juicy charts you have showing some different breakdowns or setups or even some different strategies you might be uh, using here in the markets, what's your take on right now with what's happening do you feel like there's any potential that there's far too many bullish things on the back end that a lot of us are looking at with BlackRock, Fidelity, Hong Kong, uh, what's going on? I just saw a report today that even the Rothschilds uh, have been adding to a position in, their, uh, in the ETFs uh, with Bitcoin. Do you feel like this is any potential setup for a little bit uh, overweighted bullishness or hope around what's to come? Or do you feel like it's actually in line with just where we're at in the market cycle and what we need to actually take this cycle with this higher market cap higher? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. Um, something that I touch on a lot on my Twitter and my other socials whenever I whenever I talk about this topic, I think that um, a lot of times what happens is the the narratives that we hear, the headlines that we hear um, are can be a little bit misleading because typically the reality is um, except when it comes to ETF flows, because we can actually measure that um, with the data that we have, we can actually see the amount of inflows and, and outflows per day, which is great. You normally you don't have that kind of insight in the markets. But um, aside from that one factor, most of these headlines and the things that, that, are, that we're talking about, they have some sort of an effect on the market. The problem is that we can't quantify that. We can't say, okay, this particular headline has X percentage of an impact on this market. And because it's so hard to quantify that stuff, um, for the most part, I recommend people just ignore it because people do get caught up in these headlines sometimes, and there's no way for us to know how big of an impact any singular headline will have. What we do know, without a doubt, for a fact, is the impact that it has on the markets based on price action. So mm. we could have a combination of 20 different headlines hitting us this week, and while we can't tell what each one individually is doing to affect the market, we can see how all of them together are playing a role in the market by looking at the price action that we see day to day, hour by hour. And so I always say focus on the charts, uh, and there's a famous saying out there that it, it goes, uh, show me the charts and I'll tell you the news. Because any of those news events that you see, they may have an effect. We can't quantify it on our own, but we can see their effect within the charts. And so if you just focus on the charts, then whether the news is good or bad or whether it's something you haven't even heard of, you'll know how it's going to affect the supply and demand based on looking at the charts. Man, I could not have, I, I couldn't even come up a way, with a way to characterize it as good as you just did. And you just tailored this in to actually my next question. And we're going to go to a tweet that you uh, actually retweeted today. And I'll read it to you real quick. And then I just want to hear your sort of thoughts on this on the broader view. It says, I hear people say all the time, no one knows where the market is going. Everyone is just guessing as, as a way to dismiss technical analysis as useless. And so I don't even need to bring up what the, what the retweet was there, but What's your thoughts on this idea of, because there's some people that are just fundamental investors, and I, I think I want to make that distinction. And then while the, on the other side of it, where there's people that's, that are actively trading, it's harder to use specifically just fundamentals to trade. So what's your sort of take on this, this, this claim that a lot of people make? I think partially because they don't fully understand technical analysis. How, how can, how can a, a trader, new or old, how, how do you see technical analysis actually playing a role? What's the most useful case for technical analysis with a, an investor or a trader? Yeah, so that's another another great question. Um, I think you kind of nailed it on the head. I think the biggest reason people say this, that technical analysis is useless, is coming from a lack of understanding. Um, ignorance is bliss and people don't like stuff that they don't understand. And uh, I guess the, the easiest way that I could kind of make it make sense is that uh, whether or not you think that TA plays a role, I think we can all agree on the fact that 
certain parties, certain entities out there deem a certain asset to have a fair value, right? That fair mm -hmm. value is some price point at which they believe this asset is a buy or which they believe this asset is a sell. And when they act on those beliefs, when they are, let's say, selling Doge at 50 cents, for some reason, price can't get above 50 cents. What it tells us is that some entity out there that has enough ammunition to hold price down is actively selling Doge at 50 cents. That tells us that this is a level of supplier, that this is deemed fair value for some entity out there that's big enough to keep the market below this level. And based on that, it's a, it's a price level on the chart, we can draw conclusions. If price then falls 10% down to 40 cents and we see price start stalling at 40 cents, it indicates, okay, this may be fair value for someone that thinks Doge is worth 40 cents. And so they're buying at this level. And then when price goes back up to 50 cents, we can expect a resistance there because we know based on price action or technical analysis that some large entity has been selling at this level. And that's all we're doing with, with technical analysis. We're identifying price points or levels of price of an asset at which some entity out there deems to be fair value and acts accordingly. So um, when people say that, you know, TA is a bunch of lines and nonsense, it's not really that. We're just identifying areas of interest, areas of interest where there's a, a larger amount of buyers or a larger amount of sellers. And so it certainly plays a role, whether you understand those dynamics and understand what they mean and how to identify them, that's another question. And I think a lot of people struggle with TA because they're not using it correctly. They're looking at some indicator. They're interpreting it the wrong way. They haven't spent enough time studying it. And so they dismiss it as, oh, this is useless. When the reality is that you just probably need to study it a bit more and understand exactly what it is that you're actually doing. I mean, I couldn't agree more with you on that. I think sometimes, especially newer people that come into looking at TA for the first time, they think a trend line is an absolute or they think of Fibonacci has to have a reversal or a bounce at a golden pocket. And what, what I've come to realize over the, the you know, nearly, uh, actually, I guess it is over a decade now of trading, but within crypto, uh, you know, about, about seven years or so, uh, that, as you just said, there are areas of interest. There's no absolute on anything, uh, especially in markets. And all you can do is outline areas that you're interested in and then use your other data points other technical data points, as well as fundamentals, and maybe some awareness of what's happening in a news cycle in terms of a narrative that is, uh, you know, that buy the rumor, sell the news, but tying these things together to stack towards a probability so you know how to and where to adjust your risk. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, exactly. It's all probabilities and possibilities. I mean, everything in this world is. I, a lot of people are like, no one can see the future. So what's the point of trying to predict it? And it's like, you do realize that every business in the world is based on some level of uh, analyzing past data to, to expect to like for future expectations. Like literally, that's what the entire insurance industry is built on, right? This age of driver typically has this many accidents. Therefore, we're going to charge him this much on his insurance coverage. Like, no, they can't see the future, but they're using past data to come to a probabilistic conclusion that this potential person may may uh, cost them this much and charging them accordingly. So everything is is looking at, at past data and trying to make uh, you know conclusions on what future data might look like. Nothing is ever guaranteed. It's just probabilities and possibilities. And if you use the right tools, sometimes you can get a little bit of an edge there. Man, I think it's time. We're talking about all this stuff and sort of theory and ideas around this, but uh, we're here because one, I think you have a brilliant mind. And as I said, it's one of those unbiased views on the market that carries years of experience, but also because you share some goddamn good charts. So if you wouldn't mind, let's hop into some charts. Let's break down some of the things you're looking at. And maybe what we'll start with when we jump into these charts are, uh, we could start with a very basic uh, question and then we can actually uh, sort of usher that into what you're actually seeing in the market. So uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, let me, I'm gonna go ahead on my side and uh, bring up your charts right here. Give me one second. Boom, uh, right there, that's not it. Where did it go? Boom, got your charts here. So it doesn't even matter what chart you share right now. If you're looking at, for instance, the chart that I see that you have up on the screen right now, what, what's, what's, your, what's your first most basic uh, beginner's approach, even for pros though, when you're looking at a chart, what are, what are the two or three main characteristics that you're first trying to take in before you step further and convolute it with a bunch of other lines and charts and graphs? For sure. So the first thing that you want to really pay attention to as a new new person looking at these charts is number one is time frame because this is the most like misunderstood thing on on a lot of charts. You as you can see, this is the hourly time frame, and you can zoom out and go to the daily time frame, 
and you get a little bit more price data with which to work with, you can zoom further out and go to something like the monthly timeframe. And all of a sudden you have a lot more price action with which, which to work. But it's important to recognize what time frame you're doing business on, what time your time frame you're looking at, because your bias, your perspective can change based on the time frame. For example, we're looking at the one month time frame here, and this looks incredibly bullish. We have, as you can see, I don't think this goes back all the way. It goes back to 2015, but we have Bitcoin at a low of 240. Obviously, you can see what a monster run to 20K in 2017. We had a massive correction. We had another monster monster run in 2021 to 60K, and now we're back at those highs. So on the highest of time frames, this looks incredibly bullish. We're breaking prior all-time highs. It looks fantastic. Now, if you go down to the hourly and you were to zoom in, you could show this to someone and they're going to say, wow, this looks incredibly bearish. We're just falling. So time frame and perspective on what you're looking at is very, very important. I zoom out here a little bit more. And once again, okay, well, we have a downtrend is what someone would say when they look at this. But then I zoom out a little bit further and you say, okay, maybe not. Maybe this is an uptrend and this is a correction within that uptrend. So time frame is huge. Uh, that's the one thing that you want to kind of nail down. Which time frame am I looking at? Which time frame am I referencing? And based on that, what am I planning on doing here? So obviously, as you can see here in the lower time frames, I basically marked off my areas of interest. This area where I said, look for shorts, the main resistance, why is it important? Well, you can see that price basically consolidated here. You can see kind of a series of uh, lower highs here at the highs, and you can see a series of higher lows here at the lows. And then when we got kind of to the center of the apex of this consolidation, we broke down, right? So that makes this area important. What it tells me is that you have kind of a battle between buyers and sellers. Fair value is somewhere around 70K. And then there was so much sell pressure here that we broke down, indicating that sellers are in control. They deem that 70K right now at this particular moment is considered fair value. And so there was more selling over buying here. And so price fell. So anytime we return to 70K, what can we expect? We can expect that those sellers who previously overpowered buyers may still be waiting there to offload further Bitcoin. That's why this is technically resistance. So that's like a very basic lesson. You're looking for areas of consolidation where we have breaks in structure on price movements, and those are going to be considered our areas of interest. Yeah, I mean, I love it. You know, one of the things that I, I try to echo as often as possible, and it's hard, for, it's hard for me to remember, and I'm sure you go through this sometimes too, as a content creator, even on Twitter, that you may feel like I've posted this before and not, you know, it's hard to remember that every day there's, especially with crypto as the adoption wave is going to come in, especially over the course of every three months, you have a whole larger and newer class of people coming in that may not even know what a trend line is, let alone. So I try to echo things over and over uh, so people can, you know, so the most people, especially as new people come in, uh, remember this. And as you showed out on that uh, monthly chart, this is the funny thing that really exemplifies uh, the, the the need to understand market cycles and market cycle structures, because everybody argues over whether we're in a bullish or a bearish trend and nobody identifies what hell, what time frame they're even talking about. Because on the monthly, I mean, clearly we've just, we've only ever been in a bull trend because we're basically yeah. rise, mm -hmm. retrace, continuation, and it's continuing on and on. So uh, on these small time frames, all of us, uh, many people get myopically uh, zoomed in and say it's boring right now because it hasn't moved up in the last 57 days. Well, think about mm -hmm. that. Over the last year, we've gone, was it 400 and something days on an uptrend and now we're on a 57 day corrective wave down. I mean, I, I, yep. could, I couldn't be more bullish. <laughs> Agree completely. Yeah, I think that a lot of people lose sight of the big picture. As I say, they miss the forest for the trees. Happens all the time in this space. So what are you looking at right now in terms of, uh, you already, you just, using uh, the chart you just uh, broke down a little bit about where we're at right now, but for somebody that's newer, or even kind of doesn't matter their time in, in market, what are you looking right now in terms of uh, sort of a prob probabilistic, what's showing signs of a likely rise, what's showing you signs of this is, uh, what's, what's the hope zone, what's the danger zone? Yeah, sure. So I think um, going back to the chart that I just shared here, uh, again, once again, it's important to, to kind of emphasize that this is what I'm expecting the lower time frame. If I zoom out a little bit, I'm very, very bullish here, despite what it may seem from that little clip that I just showed. But if I zoom out here, uh, I'm very bullish in that I think that our, our massive major low was put in here at a uh, 38K. And so if you consider this our last major low, then any kind of low above this level, whether it's this low here or another lower, slightly lower, or one slightly lower than that, these are all considered in my eyes, a higher low. And what follows a higher low is a higher high or a break back above 75K. So to be very clear, this is short-term bearish here as we approach 70K, but high time frame bullish on this entire structure. Because even if we reject here at 70K and we come down, even if we make a lower low below 56K, 
doesn't change the fact that wherever we end up, it's going to be above 38K in my opinion. And what follows after that is a move all the way back to the highs at 75K and ultimately, in my opinion, to 100K plus. So very important to identify the time frame that we're talking about here. And for me, because I'm an active trader and I trade these charts daily, for me, this lower time frame stuff is quite important because I can make money off of this. But for the average person who's not a trader, who's just an investor and who's buying with a six to 12 month time frame, you don't necessarily need to worry about this lower time frame stuff unless you're trying to learn and understand the mechanics of price action. If you're just investing and you're looking at a six to 12 month time horizon, all you should care about is that this is a dip that once complete somewhere above 38K is likely pushing us to 100K plus. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. I saw somebody the other day on uh, shared a chart on Twitter and they said uh, their mother, uh, it was somebody you know in their family that, that, that had gotten involved with Bitcoin uh, and he realized how stressed they were because they were excited. They were just watching the four hour, the one hour chart on a daily basis, having a panic panic attack. So he changed, <laughs> he went into her trading view because she had access to trading view and he basically set it to where all she could see was uh, the 50 and the 200 day moving average. And so you could see the general trend of the direction we're going is, is as incredible as it could be. So yeah. with that being said, okay, we, we just kind of zoomed in a little bit on the crypto market, looking specifically at Bitcoin on this sort of medium time frame. But how are you feeling about, uh, how active do you participate in, in sort of dr drawing analysis on the Bitcoin dominance? Do you feel like, it's sort of a little bit of not as relevant now because the market's broader. Is it going to change also because the ETFs are in? Are we going to get a break of that huge downtrend resistance we've been on? What is it looking like for the dominance and what does that mean for altcoins? Sure. So let's take a look at Bitcoin dominance. It's, it is actually something that I've been tracking now for literally months. Uh, in fact, back when we were in, I think this was June of 2022. So this is about... This is about two years ago, actually. We were sitting here at 47% dominance. And at the time, and you can find all the tweets on my on my Twitter. They're all there. Uh, at the time, I said that it's likely that we get a pullback to the blue zone here at about 40% dominance. And from there, I expect that we reverse to the upside, targeting at least 50% dominance, ideally somewhere above 56%. And you can see here that it played out almost perfectly. We hit just shy of the blue zone at 39%. And from there, it was pretty much up only. And um, since then, we've had many people constantly trying to call tops on Bitcoin dominance. And I think this chart I shared on Twitter as well to kind of bring people to reality where we get these repeated calls for tops on Bitcoin dominance, yet we've never actually broken market structure. And this uptrend off of the blue zone has never once shifted into a break of bullish structure. We have here basically a series of what I like to call impulses or moves to the upside, followed by higher lows and then further moves to the upside followed by more higher lows, up, 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 up to our main target of 50%. We've now broken that. We're kind of chilling here. We're seeing a little bit of a chop, but the reality is anything here is, is noise because these are ultimately higher lows being built here and there's no break in, in our dominance yet. So I think people calling for a top in Bitcoin dominance are doing it a bit prematurely. I think that we can certainly go higher. Um, I'd also like to add that going into what we often see as a parabolic tops or blow off tops like we saw in 2017, uh, that vertical or that like yeah, like that vertical movement on Bitcoin tends to happen the last ten percent of of its of its move. So typically, when Bitcoin does that sort of vertical move, you see a spike in Bitcoin dominance. And we haven't yet gotten that vertical move. I think that it's going to start after this consolidation at sixty k ends. And so more likely than not, along with that vertical move to the upside, we're going to see another spike in dominance. Even if dominance bleeds a little in between that time, which it might. It doesn't change the fact that I think we're going to see a final spike when Bitcoin goes vertical. That could hit as high as as high as sixty percent. It could go a bit higher than that. Totally depends on momentum. But I do think that Bitcoin dominance um, has not yet put in a top. There's no particular signs that it has. We have higher lows consistently with no breaks. Um, and I do think we're due for at least one more leg to the upside. And then after that, in the same way that we've seen a nonstop rally off of forty percent dominance, when Bitcoin dominance does top here, which I think will happen in the next few months. After that point, I think we're going to see a massive bleed in dominance all the way back down to sub 35% as money flows from Bitcoin into alts for a massive alt season like so, which we haven't seen since 2017. So, I mean, that's so many good points there. I guess, I guess you kind of answered my next question, but I'll have you just sort of uh, 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 expound on it a little bit. Uh, the question was going to be, you know, so I've heard some people and seen some people kind of debate this idea that now that the ETFs are here, the Bitcoin spot ETFs in the US, 
And we're seeing a huge sort of, as I'm showing it on my Twitter, as I'm posting, there's all these dominoes that I think a lot of people have been waiting on for years, but we're actually starting to see it with Morgan Stanley getting exposure with uh, Jamie Dimon, as much as he wants to hate on Bitcoin, you know, being one of the largest buyers of Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin related assets in, in Europe last year, even while he was hating on it. And we were also, they're a participant of, uh, of BlackRock. We have BlackRock involved, uh, Fidelity. The list goes on and on and on. Uh, is, there, is there a scenario here that uh, we have a, a slightly different market cycle and just huge amounts of capital that are flowing into Bitcoin in, in that Bitcoin really does outpace alts for a, you know, a more sustained period of time, this rally, or does that huge amount of capital flow, uh, because the asset is so perceptively expensive to retail, does that actually drive more people uh, to potentially you know, have that you know, alt season that nobody could have ever even forecasted because retail now thinks Bitcoin's expensive, but they want exposure, and we see a huge flood of capital sort of uh, running into alts because of that. Yeah, so another great question, and, and I've been seeing this all over my timeline too, and uh, it's um, it, I can get really deep into this. So I'm going to try and keep it as concise as I can because there's a lot of factors that come into play here, and I could go on and on about this. But um, I, once again, I'll say that you, you often – you've heard that narrative follows price. And I think this is one of those examples where back when in 2022, when Bitcoin dominance was at, was at uh, 39%. And I said, well, we're headed up from here to 50%. Hardly anyone would have agreed at the time. Why? Because there was no ETF to prove. There was this, not this narrative of ETF money flowing in. Uh, and, and yet we did exactly that. And why? Because historically, as is usually the case, Bitcoin is the first to recover out of massive corrections because it's considered the safest asset or the leader, which it is. Um, and uh, alts typically follow. They're higher risk. They they go up more when Bitcoin goes up and they go down more when Bitcoin falls. And so it's natural and normal to see a flight of capital from these battered down alts into Bitcoin in a bear market. That's just totally normal. And so what, what follows that is then a rise in Bitcoin dominance as money flows to Bitcoin and it rises. That's just normal. Whether there's ETFs, whether there's some narrative of this or that happening, that was bound to happen regardless. And now that we have ETFs that have come in and all this money flowing in, people then attach that price action to the narrative as a sort of justification as for why this happened, right? Oh, well, obviously Bitcoin's going up first because of the ETFs, but the ETFs weren't here two years ago. And, and, and that was not something that I based this move on. Um, and it's just, it's just the natural way that cycles work. Uh, so I think that the other thing that I've said is that uh, when, when the ETFs did get launched and tons of money was flowing in, you had this kind of new idea of, well, now that institutions are here, Bitcoin is up only for a super cycle. There's no way we're going down. Look at the money flow from the ETFs. There's no way that 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 uh, that Bitcoin's stopping anytime soon. Forget the the eighty percent drawdowns. Forget the bear markets. This is an up only super cycle. And then at the top, I think at the top of our last Bitcoin rally at seventy five k. Guess what we saw? We saw it in first for the first time ever net negative flows of ETFs. Right, money was flowing out of the ETFs. And even before that happened, I said, look, these guys that are investing in the ETFs, the money flow is great. But did you know that they can take their money out of the ETFs. Like it's not a one way tunnel into, right. into Bitcoin. The money can come out as well. And for someone who's in, in traditional finance, who's used to 12% annually per year in gains, when they get a 100 to 200% gain on Bitcoin within six months, you can bet that they're going to take profits and start selling. And there will be outflows of these ETFs. These ETFs are not a you know, an up only solution. They're great for the long term, fantastic for the long term. But that doesn't mean that it, it removes the possibility that we're going to see a major correction. Anytime we see price rise this quickly, as quickly as it's going to in the next six months, in my opinion, there has to be an equal and opposite reaction. There has to be a correction where there's profit taking and money flows out. It's just natural and normal. Um, with that being said, um, with that being said, I do think that ETFs are great long term. I think money flow is obviously good. And um, it doesn't really Again, it doesn't really factor into my analysis. If we're going to see a, a period of sustainable growth for Bitcoin where we don't see a massive, you know, 60, 70 percent correction, then all it means is that the, the growth to the upside will be slow and steady as well. So if we get ahead of ourselves and see a parabolic advance in the next six months, we're going to get a massive correction. If we don't do that and we grind up slow and steady for the next six to 12 months at a kind of a more of a linear rate rather than a kind of a parabolic fashion, then sure, maybe we won't see those massive corrections. But I guarantee you, if we get one, we're going to get the other. They go hand in hand. Hey, so it's kind of like a two-way street there. You know, I mean, of course, everybody in this market, especially the newer the newer uh, participants coming in, they see the, the parabolas of days past. And 
they're hoping and expecting it. It's going to also change their life with a 12, a 12 X or a 17 X or something. And that may or may not happen. I guess it also also depends on what time horizon you're talking about, but I, I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be mad if we literally stair stepped up for the next year and a half, two years, or even maybe, maybe, maybe even beyond that and have these, you know, 20, uh, 18 to 24 percent corrections along the way, that would actually be f fantastic for trading. It's going to be very interesting when we do start seeing any sort of uh, classic uh, or historic sort of signs, especially with on chain and other historical signals that have uh, previously signaled that we may be coming into some sort of crazy top that's going to, uh, you know, it's we're kind of battling this old, old world pre ETF and new world. And I guess the debate there is, are things gonna change this time? Or do, like you just said, do we just take a look at the technicals on a daily basis? Do they fit the strategy that I have? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, like you said, I mean, it would be great if we got slow and steady growth over the next two years. I think that is, is well, maybe not what most people hope for, but that's probably, that, that's definitely the healthiest way to go up here. Uh, slow and steady growth is healthiest. Um, but yeah, like I said, if we get that, that'd be fantastic. And you can probably, if we were to get that, you can kind of erase the idea of, of a, of a opposite of a parabola to the upside, like down, it's like, we won't get those massive crashes if we get slow and steady growth. So yeah, it does go hand in hand, um, slow and steady growth, which is healthy results in healthy drawdowns, parabolic growth, which is not healthy results in unhealthy drawdowns or kind of those massive crashes that we're used to seeing, which is, which is basically what happened with, uh, the drawdown in 2021, right? We got this insane movement up to 60 K in a matter of a few months. And what happened, you know, obviously there were some, some big things that unfolded, but we, we saw a significant drawdown. And if it wasn't the FTX collapse that caused that something else would have down the road because the market had just kind of gotten ahead of itself, gone up way too quickly, way too fast, way too soon. And so if ever that happens, you can expect something or the other to bring it back down, you know, to, to normalcy. And, and those boom and bust cycles are present in every single asset class in this world, not just crypto. Um, they obviously last for varying times, you know, varying cycle, you know, lengths and and time. So so keep that in mind. You could have a, like you said, I think you said earlier that we've been on the monthly kind of like an up only since inception. And, and I believe that as well, that we've been in essentially a secular bull market for the last decade on Bitcoin as we have with tech stocks. Yeah. But you look at like, you know, traditional markets and we haven't had a massive correction in the markets, I would say since 2008, really. 2008 was the last big massive crash. And we've seen in history that even in traditional markets, they can go up, you know, for 10, 20 years on end. And then one fine day, we get some massive wipeout that knocks them back, you know, like 10 years back. So that stuff is going to happen. And and 10 years, Bitcoin has only ever existed for 10, 10 years, not 10, 15 years. So the scope with which we view it has to be within that time frame that, okay, well, we've only ever existed for 10 to 15 years. There is still probably possibly some sort of an event in the crypto space that we haven't yet had the chance to see because we're still so early and it's still so soon. Yeah, I hear that. So, I mean, we've, we're talking, uh, you know, obviously, uh, somewhat broadly about the crypto market. We talked about dominance, a little bit about the uh, potential alt season that was going to be coming up after that dominance has that sort of rip to the upside and then breakdown. But what's going on? Of course, there's all, all, obviously a lot of eyes on Ethereum right now. And also the potential, which I think is still leaning more towards not happening, this ETH ETF in the U.S. But I've also noticed on the ETH, the Bitcoin chart, that we... Uh, it's not recently, it's over the, I think maybe a month ago or something, uh, maybe even longer, I, I can't, it's not coming to my brain right now, but the ETH, the Bitcoin chart broke below, I think it's like a seven year trend line or something like that. Is, is that something to, to be explained? Of course, this goes back to your first statement. We can't explain away things with narrative when charts do what they do, right? But can that be somewhat explained uh, or understood by the fact that there's a lot of capital attention uh, with bigger players on Bitcoin right now? Or is this signaling that the, that that sort of uh, the way Bitcoin and Ethereum is used to sort of, uh, you know, jump back and forth on their way up in previous cycles is 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 this time different based on what the charts see or what's your take on what's going on there? Yeah. So another great question. Um, so I've pulled up the Ethereum Bitcoin chart and this is a chart that I shared again back in November of 2022. So it's been a year and a half now. That blue box is where I shared this chart on Twitter. You can find the original tweet that I show the blue box at. And basically I talked about how it looks like we're making a topping structure here. And uh, at that time I was expecting Ethereum Bitcoin to bleed all the way down to the green zone. Initially I'd marked off this larger green zone and then I revised it down to the smaller one. But in other words, I was looking for at that time, it was a, I want to say like 40% drawdown at the minimum. 
pushing possibly to 50%. And once again, as you can imagine, there was a lot of disbelief and, and disagreement with me at the time. Um, and again, at that, that time, I had right, no, usually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So I had no idea about any ETF stuff to a year and a half ago. I had no idea that Ethereum ETF would be considered. I had no idea that Bitcoin ETFs would be accepted this year when they did get accepted. I had no idea about any of that stuff. Yet I was able to, you know, ascertain based on price action that we were likely seeing a local distribution here and we were likely to see drawdown in the coming months. And again, that was based on the idea as well that Bitcoin is recovering from this massive crash and that Bitcoin always leads. It happens all the time. And if Bitcoin is leading, then Ethereum pairings or alt, alt pairings will bleed against Bitcoin. That's all that I was saying. So fast forward until now when we've seen kind of a continuous bleed down. And now you start getting the people that are saying Ethereum's dead. Of course, the strength on Solana, people are like, Solana's the new Ethereum, Ethereum's dead, it's never going to recover, it's been down only. And back when I shared this chart in the blue circle, I had pointed out a few different key levels here. And I basically said that while I'm bearish on Bitcoin in the, I guess you could say the mid time frame here, and I expect a pullback of 40 to 50% on this chart, if I zoom out even more, I'm extremely bullish on Bic on Ethereum on the higher time frame because essentially what this is to me is a multi-year accumulation range. And I mapped out this range here. And I basically said that what we're seeing here is essentially consolidation since 2017. So since our last cycle top, this is a massive range, an accumulation range. And when this does bottom, and I have no doubt that it will sometime soon, either either close to where we are now, or maybe a bit lower down into the revised target, or maybe if thing, if Bitcoin really goes parabolic, then maybe we even get some wicks below that towards these range lows. Whenever this thing bottoms, which will be somewhere above this low, in my opinion, we are going to see, in my opinion, a shift in money flow from Bitcoin to Ethereum and to other alts. This kind of goes along with that massive alt season. And I have no doubt in my mind that Ethereum will make new highs against Bitcoin before this is over. And so if you consider what that means, if, if we get down to the green zone and we're going to make new highs against Bitcoin, just to get up back to the old highs from here, that is a 360% move against Bitcoin. And once we break those old highs, who knows how high we go, but we're looking at a three to five X against Bitcoin, in my opinion, before this is all over. And that could come months from now. Uh, but I think that it is almost an inevitability because what we see without a shadow of a doubt, when Bitcoin tops, money flows to other altcoin assets and Ethereum being the number one altcoin after Bitcoin should absolutely benefit from that. I think in terms of the ETF stuff, I was very, very confident in an ETF being approved, if not now, because I think it looks like it's going to be delayed for now, but maybe later in the year or maybe next year. Um, the only thing that's given me a little bit of pause right now is the news with the SEC potentially targeting the Ethereum Foundation. That stuff is a little bit of a wild card. Um, and the only reason I actually give it any sort of importance or any sort of significance is after seeing what the SEC managed to do to Ripple and XRP. Um, of course, XRP has been like relatively dormant for the last two years ever since the Ripple, uh, ever since the SEC lawsuit. And if it weren't for that instance, I would probably pay no mind to what's going on with the SEC and Ethereum right now. But because of that, I'm giving it a little bit of caution just because of that. I've seen what it's done in the past to XRP. And so I'm just a little bit weary about that whole thing going on. If I take that out of the equation, then there's no doubt in my mind that we we get an e uh, Ethereum ETF approved, whether, you know, maybe not now, but maybe a little bit later. And there's no doubt in my mind that at some point we're going to see a rotation of capital from Bitcoin into other alts, including Ethereum as well. I mean, such a great synopsis of what's going on, you know, and just also I want to speak to the 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 difference with Bitcoin being essentially set as is and now it's a i don't want to say tried and true but it it's getting to the point where there's it's 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 a legacy asset within the crypto space right uh and so it's trusted by that metric on the flip side you have ethereum that has all these sec crosshairs on its back there's still all obviously these questions whether it's a security or not and the truth be told it doesn't really matter to me whether it is or isn't it's just every on from a larger investor standpoint it's like you kind of want to know what you're getting involved with. And if those regulations change, that's going to impact what's going on with that asset. And in addition to that, we've had upgrades, you know, every what six months or a year and a half or something on, on Ethereum. In fact, the most recent one, Denkun, which is changing the sort of fundamental basis for what uh, uh, what Ethereum is, too. So it makes sense from a large, large investor standpoint that there could be a little bit of hesitation to to really deploy on any sort of equal level or even on a on a third basis to what they're doing at Bitcoin. So it, to me, on that on those levels, on those sort of points, it does make sense uh, that it is, as you said, consolidating a bit. But 
I do, uh, I believe over time that Ethereum uh, is, is definitely here to stay. It's just a question of when all this damn regulatory uncertainty finally gets uh, cleared up a bit. Yeah, I think you kind of nailed it on the head. And I think what you said there was kind of important. You said it doesn't matter to me if it's a, if it's, if it's a security or not. I think that's another thing that people don't quite understand. It's not it's not the fact that something is a security that makes it bad. It's just it's just the regulations change when something's a security. And that uncertainty is what causes the, the issue right now, right? Once these things are assets are cleared and it's finally determined what is a security and what's not, it's not really that big of a deal. It's just the uncertainty right now that's really getting people kind of hesitant to dabble into these things. So, you know, I think that's important to remember is that really what the issue is, it's not necessarily that something may or may not be security. It's more so that we don't have clarity in what is and what is not. And once we get that clarity regardless of what the, whether, whatever the outcome is, it's probably green lights, you know, for everything going forward. So with that being said, we're coming up on about 35 minutes here. I don't want to keep you all day long. I do have two more questions for you. We talked to obviously about uh, quite a few different topics here within this. And by the way, anybody that's watching right now, make sure you're hitting that like button and hitting that subscribe button, dinging the bell. And make sure also, I just want to shout this out one more time. Make sure that you uh, head over to Credible Crypto's page, which is right here at Credible Crypto. Give him a follow. You're going to get just a nonstop flood of incredible content on a daily basis. So I just wanted to shout that out again one more time. But I wanted to ask, okay, Bitcoin, Ethereum, I see you also dabbling some shorter term, uh, shorter time frame trades and, you know, volatility plays. But if you were just uh, on a conceptual level, uh, thinking about, you know, the, the, the next 16, 14 to 18 months, uh, you know, the, historically about how long the bull run goes post having if we were to be on that same sort of schedule this time uh do you feel like there's any particular narrative plays or narrative uh, sectors of the altcoin market that you feel like are more or less likely maybe overhyped you know we have the rwa real world asset tokenization narrative we also have the ai narrative we also have this uh it feels like ever changing and everybody's trying to get in on this hype of the d-pin narrative uh, is there any sector that like that that, that you're you're kind of focusing some of your midder to mid long term uh, 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 position trades? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, I think that a lot of these sectors. See, the thing is, like, I mean, crypto is can be applied in so many different sectors that there's something for for every sector here. Um, and there's there's so many people are finally realizing how how useful crypto is in so many different you know spaces. I think that. Uh, pretty much in terms of what sectors I'm looking at, I think that money kind of, I think none, not necessarily like that any of these sectors are better than the others. Like I think gaming is a big, a big niche that, that has a lot of demand. Um, you know, in web two, at least gaming is, is massive and it's growing and esports are are becoming huge. And so I think gaming has a space in, in web three as well and in crypto as well. And I think that AI is going to be huge. And so AI has a space in web three and crypto. And I think that real world asset tokenization is going to be absolutely massive. So that has a space in crypto. And it's like everywhere that you look, crypto can help, right? Um, so I think that each and every one of these sectors is going to have their moment to shine, their spotlight moment. And I think that it's simply going to depend on where the money rotates to. Like it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. You get, for example, let's just take DeFi. Right now, DeFi is kind of quiet, kind of like Uni, um, Aave, Compound, CRV, all these DeFi kind of blue chips that you can call that we've been talking about for years now have kind of cooled off a bit, right? There was a big DeFi run back in the day in 2021-ish, um, and those have sort of cooled off, and there's not much going on there, so money isn't finding its way there. But I, I can tell you that the minute that a couple of these DeFi blue chips start moving up based on you know price action, money starts flowing in, accumulation is done, and the charts start showing green candles, all of a sudden they're all going to start performing well and money will find its way there. And then DeFi will be the sector that everyone's looking at. And then right. money's going to flow out of DeFi into gaming and gaming is going to be the sector that everyone's looking at. Like, I mean, look at our gaming tokens. Uh, just some that I remember off the top of my head, Mana, uh, like Sand. And then there's like a few others uh, that uh, I know did absolutely spectacularly like six to 12 months ago because the focus was on gaming. Now they're down in the dumps and no one cares about them. But that's how it's going to be from sector to sector to sector as money rotates. And eventually money is going to find its way back to those sectors that are down in the dump. So my strategy is basically trying to make sure that in every sector that's that's relevant, that has you know projects building on it in crypto, I have some sort of exposure. And ideally I get that exposure when no one's looking at it and no one cares about it. So if everyone today is talking about, for example, AI or RWA because everything's pumping, I'm probably not interested. 
right now when no one's talking about gaming and they were 12 months ago, that's where I'm looking. And I'm trying to find those projects that stand out that are now down in the dumps, down 90% from their highs that no one's paying attention to so that I can load up and that when the attention eventually does shift to, I can already be positioned. I don't have to worry about scrambling to jump into a coin that's already pumped 300% in the last two weeks. So I think everything will have its moment. It's more so, um, you know, we don't know the timing exactly. So it's ideally just positioning yourself throughout the sectors that you find promising at a time when no one's really paying attention and the charts are showing that there's deep discounts to be had. I mean, you know, it's funny, uh, although he hasn't come around, come around the curve yet, Warren Buffett still has the best comment of anybody in investing ever. Buy when there's blood in the streets, you know, it's like so many people, exactly. and I, I, I talk about this every day on the BitLab Academy stream. So many people get so discouraged or overhyped by looking at the price of their asset. And I, I tell people, in all reality, price is only but another data point. You know, just like RSI or a pattern or anything, price really doesn't matter. If you're excited about it or scared about it, that means your strategy is not in place. I like to look for what's my strategy and what does the data say? Uh, you know, d if everybody's scared, okay, are they scared because there's true fundamental flaws here and we should all just dump this? Or are they scared because the narrative isn't there right now so people sold? Now, okay, now I can find some simple technolo uh, technological, simple technical uh, signals like, you know, maybe, uh, you know, a month or multi-week uh, bullish divergence or start seeing a huge spike in activity and fees and all these, you know, engagement on that chain when nobody's looking at it. And then everybody says, how'd you get Solana at $8? Well, because I wasn't following the fear narrative. I was seeing this is still getting used a lot and there's still a ton of engagement on this. So this is probably a good chance to at least at minimum take a shot. And what's the, what's the, what's the hurt or what's the risk if you're practicing risk management along the way anyway, right? So I've, I love this conversation, uh, uh, Credible. We're gonna have to do this more often. I, I, I guess uh, we can kind of wrap out here. Do you have anything uh, that you'd like me to share or that you'd like to share that you're working on? Any special links that uh, people should check out or uh, anything you got coming up? Uh, nothing in particular. I just obviously have my Twitter at Credible Crypto and then my YouTube as well, which is youtube.com slash Credible Crypto. Um, I have been trying to focus on releasing a lot more YouTube content uh, lately, and I've really ramped that up over the last few weeks. So uh, please go ahead and subscribe to me there if you want to see more content. Um, I have a lot of videos that I have planned coming up to talk about kind of the macro on Bitcoin and, of course, other topics as well. So that's about it. Nothing else really going on. Just constantly putting out content on both my Twitter and my YouTube. So give me a follow there. So it's right here, everybody. It's at Credible Crypto here on YouTube. This is exactly what it looks like. There's so many damn fake profiles on every different <laughs> social media. Make sure you're following the right people. Uh, and again, I, I can tell you wholeheartedly, Credible Crypto is going to give you unbiased and just real data on what he sees and he sometimes i guarantee you sometimes it might hurt your feelings if you <laughs> want your asset to go up and the technicals say it's going to go down then you can't get mad at somebody that you know has uh you know an anal an analytical viewpoint on something and i'm sure credible i see your posts all the time you'll post just a thought on something and there'll be like 40 people like you're wrong it's like who cares if i am wrong i'm just sharing my opinion you know yeah yeah happens all the time yeah yeah, but that, that's all I think we got for now. Credible, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, everybody. Make sure you go and follow him here on YouTube and also, of course, over on his Twitter right here at Credible Crypto. Uh, and with that, uh, if you, unless you got anything else to say, I think we can wrap it here. Uh, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Everybody, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and ding the bell. My least favorite thing to say on these socials, but we got to do it. Have a wonderful day. Make sure you share this with your friends and family and watch this back 72 times because I know Credible dropped a ton of great, great nuggets of wisdom in there. And everybody stay patient. Remember, these markets move money from the impatient to the patient. So if you're feeling a little antsy, go sit on your hands or go outside and hug a friend and kiss a tree. Do whatever what you got to do. That's all we got for now. Everybody have an absolutely wonderful day.